key papers I'll be talking about uh, in this work is uh, uh, like basically like the first one is NTU, uh, which was a paper we published last year, and that's the paper which has like the first author is Jenny, who is like a PhD student at UAC, uh, me, and another PhD student who was also another PhD student from UAC, and some of the other work, and the last uh, uh, two work are like from my PhD thesis. So. What is language modeling and representation? That's kind of the key idea of this uh, uh, presentation. And one thing I want to like you know, just set uh, like uh, set up for all of you like uh, how many of you already know like about language modeling or like representation learning? Uh, okay, quite a few. Okay, how many of you have like are hearing this word for the first time? Okay, <laughs> yeah, I would be surprised if people will be hearing it for the first time. Okay, so. Technically, like the key goal of language modeling is like the um, so first thing I want to make clear uh, to everyone is computers don't understand uh, like text as such. Uh, uh, they understand like you know some symbols and those symbols get converted into some mathematical numbers and then computers can work with those numbers. Uh, so one of the first things uh, which like the way computers understand text is like you take a text and you, like you you split it into a list of tokens uh, and once those tokens are there, then you are interested in like learning some representation. So, uh, if you are working with like say any programming language or like with any uh, mathematical equation, you usually have like the idea of a function. And here in this case, uh, for uh, language modeling or representation learning, the function takes a text as an input, and then it outputs a score or a probability. Uh, if it outputs a probability, like usually, like that's something like which we relate to language modeling objective because like we can use that probability to know that hey, like this sentence is more probable. We can use it to break it down to know if I know the prefix of the sentence, what is the suffix of the sentence. And the second approach is like if this function just returns a score, we can use it to compare if, like hey, how the score of a good sentence should be uh, like you know uh, better than the score of a bad sentence. That's usually called a contrastive objective. These are the two dominant approaches people take, like when they work with text, especially like when they're interested in building like language models or like some text representation. And why do people do this? Uh, because uh, the idea here is that if we can somehow learn a very good general purpose text representation, this FX, uh, F text, then we can use it to improve the performance on some downstream models. So that means, like you know, we will take, like, let's say, a downstream task is uh, topic classification. So we will simply, uh, in the topic classification function, we use instead of using the text normally, we will just use this representation of the text, and then we'll get like a much better way of uh, like predicting the topics of the text, or for any other uh, like. Uh, Problems, for example, like hiding some main entities, uh, like linking entities in a text, or something else. Uh, so that's kind of the key idea of language modeling representation learning. What are the applications of language modeling? Again, right now at the current stage, there are like just too many applications we can talk about, like it's completely, especially with some of the language models we have available these days. Uh, there are so many applications. These are some of the more fundamental applications, I actually had a chance to work with it at Twitter. So one of the basic thing is like just content representation. Uh, this is like you know if we have some text, uh, like we would want to store that text, like text not in the text manner, but we would want to store it in a compact manner so that we can compare two texts are similar to each other, and then use that to like say recommend content, like for example on Twitter, uh, and like you know. Uh, do some sort of post processing on the text, like to identify, like, hey, what are the topics of this text, what are the main entities in this text, and so on. Uh, right now, one of the language models which is like most popular is like generative language models. So these are like uh, models which take uh, just a prefix of a text and then like they complete the So this is something if you, many of you have been following the news uh, recently, like, how many of you have heard like chat GPT? Anyone who has not heard about ChatGPT? Okay, yeah. So okay, so yeah. So this is what exactly like ChatGPT, like or many of similar type of models do. Like you give it a, a prefix, which nowadays people call a prompt, and then the model like simply tries to complete that prefix. And because this model has been trained on so much data, it can figure out from your prefix what should be the right suffix of the model. 
and uh, like there are many ways of like doing this prefix. In fact, it's like a very very good approach to just get started like, from zero to one on most of the problems. Because if you give a prefix like hey, I want to identify the sentiment in a tweet, and you give a few examples that like this is tweet one, this is the sentiment of tweet one, and this tweet two, the sentiment of tweet two, and then you give tweet three, and you don't give a sentiment, it will try to like I, a lot of times will give like a very good answer. Uh, uh, so you will get like pretty good baseline accuracy from just using this language model, and you don't have to like you know, collect any data. Uh, you can just define your problem as clearly as possible, and it will give you the answer. The second approach is uh, what people have called is that sometimes just giving the answer is not enough. So then, like you know, people say that okay, just before giving the answer, just tell me like how you will come to the answer, and there are like lots of tricks. It's a very growing field. Uh, and like one of the very dominant approaches which came out like a few, uh, I think, months ago, which given the current pace of research in this field is very old, is chain of thought prompting, not a few months ago, I think it's almost like a year right now. So, and uh, what this does is like simply like, you know, just give me step by step instruction before coming to the answer. Nowadays, like, I think just you. One, one month back, like someone came with a paper, he said that if you just add a text, like just take a deep breath and then give the answer, it does like much better. So again, like, there are a lot of tricks and it's a very uh, open area. I don't think like a lot of it is like a very principal approach, but it's something like which tells us like you know, how the model might be, like how you can extract the best information from model. So these are like uh, some of the ways you can apply generative language model. Again, this is the general framework. You can use this to construct whatever task you want, like whatever problems you want to solve. So coming back, like so, language modeling, as I was talking about, is not like something very new. Like uh, for many people, like, like how many of you heard about language models, say maybe five years back? Okay, how many of you did not know this thing called language modeling, like five years back? Okay, so yeah, so yeah, and uh, how many of you only got to know it? Like maybe one year back. Okay, yeah. So yeah, it's so it's. The, I want to tell you, like, it's a very old problem. And in fact, the key idea of like given a prefix and predicting the suffix is as old. So the one of the first uh, word I had is engram language models. If you can just train a model like you know using just five word as prefix and <laughs> to predict the suffix, it does work very well. And there are a lot of like very good open source engram language models as well. Uh, which you can use, they have like a lot more control over, uh, like you, know, you have a lot more control on how they can do this generation. But of course, like they were restricted in like you know how you can scale them on like much larger data sets and like the kind of things you can do. Then came another very foundational paper, uh, I think right now it's like almost 10, 10 plus years back, which was what we which was uh, public, like so not only was the technique uh, uh, like pretty good. But this was one of the first papers which actually open source their model and said like, hey, like we have created a representation of like close to a million words using a large amount of text data. And now using this, you can find like, okay, if uh, man is to king, then woman uh, is to queen, right? So, and you can like identify these kind of phenologies. And then like people came up with like many follow-up models and write that led us to where we are today right now, like ChatGP is like a name Many of you uh, may have heard. There are other open source. So ChatGPT is not open source, but it's like accessible to many people uh, via the API. Llama is another model, like uh, open source by Facebook. It's a fully like you know accessible model. Anyone can use it, and there are like many variants of it. Uh, Bert was another one which was like very foundational. So how many of you have heard about Bert? Uh, okay. How many of you know about ChatGPT but don't know about Bert? Okay, yeah. So Bert was like, I would say like Bert is like one of the moments uh, which it was a very powerful model, like open source by Google, and that led to a lot of like this GPT, Chat GPT, like uh, uh, like you know follow up works. Uh, like GPT and Bert, I think like very similarly, and uh, Bert was more around the representation learning objective. Uh, GPT, which came as a follow up, was more around the generative uh, learning objective. And that's kind of the key distinction between some of these models. So just the key idea of the slide is like, this is not a new technology, it has been there. And you see this kind of cycle in technology again and again, like many of the new things, like with the new tools, the right hardware, uh, like you know, the right set of data, they come back and 
when the time is right. And I think like the time is right for like, any of these language modeling technology to be used properly. So a quick trick, if you want to find new applications for language models, just go read the old NGRAM language model application papers. Many of the pe people may not have already applied it, but now because they're possible, they can easily apply it. So what has changed uh, recently? One of the big things which has changed recently with these language models is uh, scale. So earlier, like people used to train like small, small models. Like I think like word to web was like pretty big. It was not a model. It's like just a file which has like words as the first uh, like uh, entry in the file, and then a list of like uh, floats, uh, and then like that's what the file was. I think had like a few million uh, words in it. And nowadays, like the language models, they have like you know billions of parameters. Like one of the uh, older like biggest open source model was around like 140 like billion parameters. Right now you can do a lot of very good things just using like 7 billion or 1 billion parameters as well. So, but many of these things require like, uh, you know, being able to uh, process uh, these kind of like uh, models like very fast. So that's why we have, earlier people didn't have access to GPUs. Uh, and now like people have access to GPUs, these models can run really fast and they have access to a lot of data, which is like uh, the early people did not have access to a lot of like good quality data to train these models. Then there were many efforts like common crawl, which like allowed people to access all the data on the internet and use that to train the models. So there are like, many open source efforts and then of course like you know, companies who are building these models, they have like their own like specific data. So that has led to like, you know, you see like the huge size of models. GPT's uh, actual size is not yet known, but like if you look at the Palm e model, which is from Google, uh, it's like 562 billion parameters. It's like a pretty huge, it's, if you try to download it, like I'll talk about like 7 billion parameters, if you try to download it's around like uh, 15, 16 gigabytes just like to download the files. And then you try to use it and that takes like an additional memory and so on. So just think of it like, you know, you can't like run many of these models like simply on your laptop. Uh, the 7 billion models you can uh, run. So, so a lot of the innovation has happened in just improving the infrastructure, the speed of like how people can actually use these models. And I mean, this is a slide uh, from like very good like paper called LLM survey, which tells us like you know, how how fast you have seen like the different varieties of language models have come up in the recent uh, like few years. So it's like started at 2019, like T5 was one of the very good like prefix, suffix models uh, which Google released. And then they have, since then they have been like so many like models in just like a span of four years. And right now we are at GPT every day, like I mean, earlier I was trying to keep track of uh, things, but uh, now every day if I see a new model, I think that like, okay, I'll come back to this model in one month. And maybe by that time, like there would be something else much better. If it stands the time of like one month, so uh, you have like seen like test of time awards. Right now, the test time of test of time awards is probably one. If your model stands on the leaderboard for one month, it's like pretty good. Uh, so that's like the speed of the research which is happening. A lot of people are doing like, like, very good research. They're finding uh, like you know uh, good. Uh, improvement to this model. One thing I'll say, like I found like GPT is still like pretty well ahead. Right? So that's again a very testament to how like good the model like, uh, uh, OpenAI has built. Uh, but yes, uh, there are a lot of like pretty good models coming every week which are more accessible, which give you a lot more flexibility. And one of the big things like uh, which is like uh, motivating people to continue uh, their work in this direction is uh, called the scaling law. So this is like from one of the papers which came out a few years back, which said that if we scale the the number of parameters of the model, the num the data set size, or the compute of the model, the model's performance will actually continue to improve. And for people who have worked in networks, like uh, the plot which came out was like something like a power law. So it's like a log log plot, and you see that like you know as uh, these parameters or data set size, everything else moves. Uh, these numbers actually like you know continue increase. So it's, it was so that also like because it's the power of plot that means like you know, getting the next one percent improvement will be uh, like almost an exponential number of like compute data set uh, size parameters and so on.
So it's a good direction like people came up with, uh, but again, uh, it also shows that like there's some limitation in terms of eventually, uh, like if you just continue like, scaling, like do we have uh, like all the right gaps? And there, like people are trying to find out tricks to work around this. Uh, so this is like just uh, kind of setting like till now I only talk about language models. So. Uh, here, like this is the hypothesis, like which I had, like when I was working on, uh, like you know, many of similar kind of problems. Is real world data is actually not just language. Like so, a lot of like the hypothesis for many of, of the work recently, which you see happening, is that hey, everything can be formulated as a text, uh, and uh, like you just give a prefix, and somehow the model will come up with a suffix, and uh, that will solve my problem. Uh, and what like uh, I. Uh, was uh, like identifying and again like, it was validated like with many collaborations that real world data is like also requires a lot of context which cannot uh, be aptly described just by text. You would need like some other way of describing that context. So let me give a few examples. So this is like again using the old like word models like old by me like you know by means of the current progress so, like a very old like uh, model. Uh, so, and this model used to have the objective which is like given a text, you will like uh, mask one word, like so you say that okay, fill in the blanks, right? And uh, I asked it like, you know, okay, I reside in the state of mask and this is the answer. So it like says Washington, like this is the first one. So if I just use this model directly, it will say I reside in the state of mask, but I don't reside in the state of mask, I, uh, Washington, I reside in the state of Illinois right now. So, and what, what is giving away that information is if it has like some way of encoding my location information. So of course, like one way of saying this like, hey, I live in the city, uh, say Woodridge or Urbana, and then like I reside in the state of, then like it's very likely to uh, complete it with like say Illinois. But uh, there are like a lot of cities which happen. Actually, I got to know when working on this that there's a city called New Delhi in the state of New York also. New Delhi or Delhi. Uh, so if I say like you know I I live in the city Delhi and I reside in, in the country, it will say like you know India. But uh, because that's the most popular answer, if the answer you will, if million people tried it, you will get like 90% of the 90 be right. Uh, but then like you still like missing our key information. So what this uh, question requires is some sort of location context. And again like for many cities. You can describe the location context by having a better, more informed reason, but sometimes it's not possible. The second case is uh, like you know uh, temporal context. So if I like ask that okay, like you know, President Dash is the current president of USA, uh, the model like this is what model it was like I think released uh, 2016 or something like that. So even at that point of time, it was like predicting Obama. So which is not correct even at that point of time, and it's not correct, right? So that means like you know. There's some sort of temporal context. Information keeps changing. And there are like a lot of things people are working. Again, like if you're working on any AI startup, there's a lot of work around retrieval augmentation or like using some kind of like you know fine-tuning, uh, continuous fine-tuning or something like that. But the key idea is that it requires some sort of understanding of time. Like, you know, it, what time is this text situated in? Uh, if like maybe if it was a tweet from 2013, like you know, that time like uh, this would be correct. But if it was a tweet from like you know uh, like past week, that's an incorrect uh, answer. And the last one is like uh, this is like what I was working a lot on like text and social networks. So the last one is like social context. So and this is uh, uh, like again an example. Like so happy to see the Dash win their NFL match. I don't know, like what is the NFL team of Illinois? Like, uh, is there like one? Bears. Uh, Bears. Bears. Okay. Yeah. So again. So. People like the Bears fan will be like you know uh, not very happy if it says that Giants is the like you know one day match uh, if uh, like you know they're using it. So again, but here like it's not necessarily uh, a location or time context. It's more about like hey I have like a friend circle of like all the Bears. So here like it's a social context, and you want to use that social context to fill in the blanks. So again, why are all these problems important to me? Like especially like when I was working at Twitter, like you know a lot of times you want to understand the tweet. So you want to know like, hey, like this tweet is like sent from this location, like sent from this time, it's sent by like you know D 
these group of people who happen to be like, you know, in this community. So, and that gives you like, so I was working a lot on entity link, and that helps you identify that, hey, okay, like, there's a word, like, for example, John is a very common name, right? So they might be like, say, a John uh, player in all these things. So how do you know, like, which John, like, people are talking about? Uh, and then, like, we can link it to the correct John. So, uh, all those problems, like, help us identify that these are, like, some of the common types of context, like, which are, like, required. And this is somehow something which you cannot directly model inside a language model. There are cases where you can just say, like, give some prefix text. There are two issues with that. One is, like, of course, you have to come up with the right way of describing the text. And second is, like, especially with the current language model, it uh, increases the compute you have to do. So, like, the longer the description, of course, like, if you give very elaborate description, it will, like, you know, uh, it may be able to uh, solve your task, but, like, you know, you have to come up with the right one. It will slow down your model. It will slow down your process. So, and if you're working in industry or any like you know, any customer facing problems, there accuracy is not the only thing which matters. Like, there are two things uh, which matter: like being accurate and being fast. If you are too late, uh, like the customer is already left. Like you know, so uh, like you you can give them the best answer, but they are not there to like you know make a purchase or do whatever uh, you wanted them to do. Uh, it's a very common analogy also from search systems. Like, I think there was uh, a report which said that like every 10 100 millisecond uh, increase in latency like cost uh, like uh, the company's uh, in search response time that like, cost the company like significant number of like uh, dollars uh, in their revenue. So this is how like important like speed and accuracy is. And whenever you're building products, like you have to think about like what is the right trade-off uh, between them. Uh, similarly, like uh, people who have worked on translation, like this is like uh, this was some of the examples which I had like the most fun uh, like making, like I didn't find. So this is and like Yana is here, so uh, this is an example which is like if I'm visiting, so I'm, I'm not German. Uh, if I'm visiting a German friend, I brought this drink as a gift for you, and all the guests are like you know looking at uh, me in awe. So like, are they like? Any people who understand like what the weird thing happening there is? Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> Can you share? Gift means poison. Yeah. <laughs> so and I was like, uh, yeah, gift means poison. So it's like, and let's say like you know the the people who are sitting there are not like people who know English. So they are like maybe like you know, people who only know German. And they're like, why oh, like this person is bringing poison hearts? And this one is also like you know weird, which is like, uh, is there any person who knows Polish here? So, okay, yeah. So this is like you know. I hope this day brings you lots of fun. And again, like in English, that's uh, something which <laughs> is considered good. But like you know, it, like uh, Polish, like that means lucky. So again, I'm not saying like this is something which is very likely to happen. But like you know, people come from all like different contexts. Like especially if you are in a language learning stage, like you are new to a language. You're likely to make these kind of mistakes, and this is like how, for example, if your language model was, you're trying to engage with a language model, like they don't know like what level of like fluency you have in the language, and uh, like you know, uh, if you are trying to mark someone as like you know if the answer is correct or not, like you know you will like mark that like, oh like oh, this is like completely like wrong sentence, but that person has the right context there. So all those things happen. Uh, and this is the example which I actually like was working on, which like uh, I happened to use a lot in my papers, especially coming back to the idea of tweets. Uh, this is a text, like so. This is like one of the uh, um, uh, tweets I gave, like based on like uh, one of my papers or like you know, something got published uh, based on my thesis. And this was like one of the tweets. So based on this, like again. Many of you will know like many of these words, but like let's say I was not talking to a UAE audience. It's like high school UI is like you know uh, like Illinois uh, high school. U of I is also like regional lab, like Yana's lab, Twitter handles, and this is based on my thesis. But can you tell like what is the topic of this tweet? Can you tell? Like make a guess. A language model of some kind. <laughs> But if I give you like so this so now people write tweets in threads, right? So like I actually wrote a thread. So this is like and a lot of times like when people do processing, they say like okay, every tweet which is coming, like we'll process it one by one, right? But a tweet actually exists as a part of the thread. So this was like one more tweet of the thread. 
And now can you predict like what is like the topic of the tweet? Uh, have you changed your decision, sir? A, a, a little, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did you change it to? Uh, I'm, I'm well, Pytail is a tool, and so it's, it, it, it looks like it's more around learning than it is necessarily like generative language. Yeah, yeah. Good. And now this is the first. One. So when I get like a three tweet thread, or maybe like there more. And this is like the first. Tweet. So this is uh, related to like my work. And in the first tweet actually has the key topics like active learning, online learning, human in the loop, places. So I was like tweeting about this and if I would have like processed it like a regular system, like I would have just like looked at each tweet individually and I would have lost the money. So in fact like all the tweets are related to Murex, which are like one conference like which uh, was happening at the time. So ideally if you want to like say for example suggest a tweet, you would want to suggest say the, the top tweet in the thread and then like propagate the context that like <coughs> all these tweets belong to Murex context. And what are the key, key giveaways here? So one of the things I would highlight here is, first of all, if many of you like might think it's just a text data, tweet is not text. First of all, like, I showed you the network of the tweet, but it's still not text because there are like things in the tweet which are like ad genre reason. Like I mean, the the phrase is like giving away the name, but like you know I can have like a weird handle as well, like you know maybe like wacky starfish, right? Something like that. So that doesn't give away like what this word meant. Uh, so Yan is like very like a descriptive handle, like it's easy to know. Uh, but like many uh, like many accounts might not have that kind of handle. So, but what is really happening is like this is actually an individual token, which should be thought of in the context of what it means in the whole network of tweets. And so, and it's also like a signal around like what community. So, for example, if you have a user handle. If that user handle is not necessarily just the words in how the handle is written, it has its own social context. Like, uh, you know a lot more about the user just based on their, uh, like, uh, as opposed to just what the string of their handle is. Uh, so this is what I call like the community signal, especially around like high school UI, University of Illinois, Pisner Lab. Like, these are all like community signals. Like, if people know like what kind of tweets these accounts. Tweet, they will have much more understanding than just by looking at the text of uh, these handles. Uh, the second one was like hashtag. Again, hashtags people tend to use like just I'll just split the hashtag somehow like you know I'll, I understand it from the text. It's very accurate to like uh, maybe eighty percent of the cases, but people can make like all sorts of hashtags. Uh, and uh, again, it's a more like a topical signal. So. The hashtag should be thought of in like what other tweets are talking about this hashtag. That's the like at that point of time, uh, which is a more important giveaway about the content of the hashtag as opposed to just its text. And the uh, yeah, and the third one is of course the network of the tweet, which is important. And uh, people can come up with like different ways of describing. So for example, like some quick tricks like which have been published in paper is that they look at the user handle, look at like what that is. Uh, the bio or like the description is on the handle and then maybe replace the handle by that and that will give you like some more context um, but really like you know it's like you're still replacing that handle that handle means more than what the text is the second thing is that which I'll talk a bit later is like how many of these language models I as I if you remember like I told you these language models don't understand the text they still split that text into some tokens and then they try to work with those tokens and a lot of times when that splitting happens, and this is like a very, very uh, open problem, not a lot of people work on it, but it's a very important problem. Like whenever you see like animal models making error, like go back and check it. Is the tokenization happening correctly? Uh, like many of the, say for example, GPT style models, they have like a, the fallback tokens is uh, like, you know, they have like a token for every character. So because it's trained on huge data, like even just by using character data, like they can still process pretty well. But this comes up very often, like when people have a huge model, even GPT style models. If you, you try to apply them to languages which don't have the Latin script, they perform like pretty badly. Uh, and because it's like the tokenization per word, like uh, the number of tokens per word, 
uh, in those languages is like much larger compared to like you know the number of tokens per word in English. Like for English, like hello will probably be single token. So like the model knows exactly what hello is. But say in, uh, like in Hindi, like the word hello like will might be split into five tokens. So it can still understand what it is, but it will have to like spend a lot more like you know compute to be able to do the same thing. And Many of these models also use something called attention mechanism. Again, I don't want to talk about the technicality of it, but coming back to the point on why these things can be slow, like this attention mechanism is something which is like uh, of the order of n squared. So if your text length is 100, uh, think of it like the number of compute operations you have to do is going to be 100 squared, which is like, uh, sorry, yeah, 10,000 uh, like operations. So that's how like, you know, if you give longer, uh, like descriptions, uh, or if you have like more tokens, like you would be increasing the compute uh, in the square amount of like uh, uh, by the order of like you know, square number of tokens, as opposed to just like linear. So all these things lead to like you know a lot of trade-offs in how people end up using this, especially if you're planning to use it for real-time applications. Uh, so now. Uh, I come, so till now, like any questions, I'll take a pause and like I have finished like one round of like language models, context, like, any questions you have. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. So I'll continue now. So now I, during my PhD, like I was like actually thinking about like these kind of data set and like how can we like best describe these kind of data set and like where do we find them? So. I had like uh, uh, I was like fortunate to actually like work on two different, completely different types of data sets during my PhD. One was uh, a social media data set, which like example I showed you before. The other one was scholarly data set, like research papers. So and research papers I found like they also have like very similar type of uh, like structure. Uh, so research papers don't exist in isolation; they like, build on like you know, other research papers. Uh, even in terms of tokenization, if you have like read a paper, like sometimes like people have like citations with. So you can't just treat it as like one, two, comma, or if like someone has like you know Mishra et al. You can't just treat it as Mishra et al. Like you have to think, oh like that Mishra et al actually refers to some other paper which has some other context. And they have like again a temporal trend, like there are a lot of people like involved in a research paper, so you know a lot more about uh, these kind of things. So uh, like this was like one of the main things like I proposed to my thesis was like that like, we can think of these type of data sets as like digital social trace data. So why uh, like trace? Because it's like these things evolve over time. Like uh, you know social media data sets evolve over time. Uh, same goes for scholarly like research. Like you know scholarly research papers they evolve over time. They have like uh, you can't like think of it as like a big chunk. All of it was generated at one part of time. Like they have like a temporal uh, access. And then they have like a huge amount of connections between them. So I'll give some examples here. This is like uh, the kind of like connections like I uh, could come up like for social media data. So you have like you know uh, users uh, who are making tweets. Users are also interacting with other tweets uh, or like you know just general posts. And these tweets sometimes happen to share some topic signals, uh, happen to share like some other like user mentioned signals. The users also have like some known attributes, some like you know hidden attributes uh, which like might not be uh, available on the system. These tweets also have like you know some additional attributes. So and then the whole thing has like a temporal code. And similar kind of pattern I also saw in like scholarly publishing data. And this is like where like uh, it like kind of like inspired to think like okay what if we could actually utilize this data like in the right manner to solve our problems. And uh, uh, at that point of like most of the processing was happening just at the text level. So you just process one thing at a time. And this is a very good reason. It's not that like I'm the first person to think about it and like, you know, that's why it's like so important. There's a very good reason like why people were not using the whole structure. It's because of computation complexity. Like you know, the more interactions you want to consider, the more compute you have to like you know use. And so again, like the problem comes like how can we best approximate that like you know those kind of complex interaction and summarize them so that we don't increase the compute too much and still get like an increased accuracy. And that like helped uh, identify like you know, some follow-up research problems. Um, so what I was like talking about is like most of the language models that you see today like actually missing these kind of context. There are like some recent type of language models which are coming up with way to utilize this context. 
Uh, I do talk about like them like later in the slide, so I'll, I, uh, I'll like, not elaborate on that uh, right now too much. But like some one of the works like was like we did in like simple ways of including including this context in language models. So one of the very simple things I actually like did use during my PhD, and this was not using like any fancy language model, like no deep learning or nothing. This is just like scikit learn or like logistic regression. Uh, so as I was telling, ngrams also like are like some you can use ngrams to learn representation of text. And uh, like how many of you have heard like about the sentiment prediction uh, task? Like, it's like one of the the most standard tasks. Uh, so sent idea for those how many of you don't know about sentiment prediction? Okay, uh, yeah, good. So mainly like you know the task is like given a tweet like predict if it's positive or negative, you know, right? And most of the time, like people again just formulate it as a text-based task, and like, hey, this is the text, like just try to like make prediction based on that. And most of the papers were just like using this formulation. And uh, when I was like actually downloading data from Twitter, like using their API, I was getting all these additional algorithms, like, okay, yeah, like we are just throwing it away, like you know, what we, what what is there in these algorithms? Like maybe we can try to use them. And like I just did like simple, like you know, in that again that n-gram model. I did like some additional signal which was based on derived from the URLs, hashtags, like properties of the user. And I thought that okay, like can it move uh, the attributes? So these are like some of the attributes I used. Uh, I'll not talk too much about, but mainly it was like attributes around the user, how we can better represent the user, how we can represent the tweet. And if you use that, like first I check like are these attributes somehow correlated uh, with these like you know labels? And it really did really find like there was like significant correlation in, at the individual attribute level. But again, like that doesn't matter too much if it doesn't improve the model performance. And it did like almost on all tasks. Like uh, I got like straight away like two percent improvement. So this is like anyone else who's just using the text data. Like so, the first one is if I only use the extra attributes, of course that will have very bad performance. If I just use text data, like you know, I'll get a significant performance. And then if I use the joint thing, which is like both the attributes plus text, I was like seeing like uh, direct like two percent improvement on all the on all the data sets I was And I was like, this was quite surprising. Again, I will uh, add one caveat here: like many of these attributes uh, are computed after the tweet is generated. For example, like there are certain patterns like if a tweet is negative, like it may have like more. Uh, like kind of like say retweets, more people might engage with it. Uh, so I will not use it as like a, a, a model directly for any kind of prediction task, but it gives a hint that there is an additional signal. Uh, and like we highlight in the paper, like don't just go and like think that you will have access when a tweet is created. You won't have access how many people engage with the tweet. Uh, that's something which happens post hoc, and it also might be dependent on the tweet label. Uh, but the fact is, those signals are there, and if you can somehow find like what other preceding signals can be used, uh, you can still improve the accuracy of the models. So this led us like to one of the. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this led us like this was like one of my first uh, follow-up work on this uh, uh, line of research. Uh, at Twitter, uh, where we thought, okay, like you know, we now want to understand tweets, and like again, we, uh, like me and my like you know, co-authors, like, we knew that like tweets don't exist in isolation. So, what is the simplest way we can add? And we saw that okay, like if we can somehow add, so and this is some very fundamental thing like for many of you to learn. So, uh, as I told you, like you know, uh, models don't understand text. You split that text into some tokens. They convert those tokens into some numbers, and then the model does, like works on those numbers, and it gives us that feeling that, and then it tries to project those numbers back into the text, and that gives us an idea. Oh, it's somehow understanding the text. So we we knew that construction. So we said that okay, once it converts everything into numbers, uh, then it's like it's not looking at the text anymore. So if we have something else which can also be converted into numbers, and we add that to the model, we don't have to write it in form of text. We just have like a new set of numbers. We just concatenate those numbers uh, and then like feed it into the model. It might uh, like you know uh, help improve the task. And that's what we did. So we had like the regular uh, like word style model, and we said that we'll define something called a social context embedding, which is somehow whatever the social context like which I described earlier, we can somehow have like another number for them, like which is like for people who are using NLP every day or working these models, which we call vectors. 
So or embeddings, right? We said like let's have like some social context embedding, and then we concatenate that as an additional thing. And now the way these model works is that uh, they look at uh, the embedding of all the words, other words, and they try to make a prediction. So he said here what we are doing is like they not only look at the embedding of all the other words, they look at the embedding of all the other words plus the social context, and can that solve it? So this is where like I was going back to the example. I live in the state of. Mass. If the city is San Francisco, we can convert San Francisco into an embedding. We can get like the state of California, and that like gives us some control. So like we can now control that. Hey, like depending on the user location, we we'll have like a different answer. And the way we did like this embedding generation was very simple. That uh, like uh, again, we can come up with like very complex ways of encoding. But one way which we thought was that most of these social contexts can be better described by graphs, uh, which is that. Hey, like what other things are is like this item related. So, for example, in, in case of cities, you can find other like you know nearest neighbor cities, and then you know that okay, like San Francisco and Vegas is closer to each other, so they should have like embeddings which are similar to each other. Like uh, New, uh, New York City and Jersey City like uh, should have like closer embeddings. Dallas, Houston should have closer embeddings. And you can like come up with like different constructions of what you mean by uh, like how close these are, and then you can use that to get this right embedding, and that once we got that embedding, we just feed it into the model. And again, as we uh, see here, we saw a significant improvement uh, in like almost all the tasks. One thing I want to highlight here is that the, uh, if we somehow like were always including the word the SF here, or like we said that okay, like this is city SF, we have it as an additional token in the sentence, and if we train the model accordingly. Uh, on the same cities, like cities which the model has seen during training, the model performance is almost the same. But when a city is not seen, and this is like where, which I was like trying to highlight earlier, like you may not have all the cities in your training data set. For those cities, like the model performance was like pretty bad. So and like, but uh, in fact, it was like even worse than like the regular bird model. So what we uh, like our hypothesis here is like the regular bird should be a good fallback option and use the context if it's available. And you see, like you know, in the unseen cities, like the model performance like degrades significantly, uh, but like you know, our performance like remains like uh, pretty like much uh, like similar to the other ones. And this is like how we get like a significant improvement in the performance of these models for different social context uh, cases. And again, like these are some numbers, but I'll like just give some examples here, like you know, how the social context changes in the state uh, case. Uh, same goes for the NFL case. Uh, so, any questions till now? Yeah? It sounds like if I understood correctly, you're using the social context as an additional token in your language. Is there a sense in which you could decode that token back to get a word representation of your social context? Would that make sense? Uh, yeah, you can like think of, but you still have to train your model to that. Like, uh, so, uh, like, so what you, if I understand correctly, your question is like, if we have a social context going as an input, can we decode it back into some text, right? Yeah. Uh, I think you can uh, do that. Like, in fact, like uh, one context which I haven't talked yet about is image context. So many of the uh, like you know tweets they also have like images, videos, audios in there. And like one of the like very uh, popular line of research right now happening is the multimodal language models. This is exactly what they do. They feed in the image as a context, and then they try to get like some sort of text representation out of it. And like they have like a specific uh, description on that. Hey, like describe this image. So if you, how many of you have used Chat GPT Vision, like the Vision plugin? Uh, yeah. So if you have, if you have the paid account for Chat GPT, uh, they have I think like launched. So you can upload an image and say, like describe this image. And I will actually like let me just show that to you. I have like a few open source models. So this is an image. Oh, yeah. So this is an image of, of like you know, uh, two puppies, and like the uh, the code here is like you know just describe like write a detailed caption for this image, and this is how the model describes it. Like you know describe this image in detail. So this is like what it says like two adorable golden retrievers. It actually links to these two retrievers sit side by side in a field of grass and whatever, right? And similarly, there was like another model uh, from a startup called Adept uh, AI, and they also have like the same thing, like you know, just give an image, ask it a question, how it's made, and the desert is made with a layer of fog pastry, and uh, all those things. So, 
uh, like you know, you can like you have to train a model to be able to do that kind of decoding. We were not interested in the decoding part. We were simply interested like uh, how can we get like better representation of our text data. Uh, but yes, like people are working around this, and like um, I, I haven't seen a lot of work which do it in the graph context, like where, which we were doing. But that was like a very like you know obvious like, follow up work. Like, yeah. How do you select the context that you, you add to the model? Because in one case, what city I live in, what state am I in, that, that, that seems to have a, a location embedding, which makes a lot of sense. But if I ask, who is Fido? Who is? Who is Fido? Then that, that you know, the, the context of that's my dog makes a lot of sense. But if I ask, who's John? That, that could be my dog, that could be my friend, that could be my spouse. Yes. And, and so, how do you select what is the relevant context to add to the model? Yeah, so and that's a good question. Uh, one of the things which we are doing is like, so for users, like we know the exact context we have, like uh, we know like you know what location like they have provided. Uh, sometimes like you know tweets also have location, so you can use directly that. Uh, you also have like a, a the one of the second paper I'll talk about. Like we have a holistic user representation, so we know that what tweets the user has tweeted, like what tweets they have engaged with. Using that, we can construct a user representation, and that will give. So, for example, like you know, there are like two Johns in the room, and uh, yeah. So, and we have like you know, one of the John like uh, is like you know more likely associated with your tweet. Like we will be able to know that from all the other tweets you have tweeted or like, engaged with, and that will help us disseminate. Again, you cannot if you have like you know, if you tweet a lot with like say uh, two Johns. It might be difficult for us, but I think like hopefully if you talk on different topics with both Johns, like that can be uh, like a like a what tie breaker for us. So again, that goes back to the problem of like disambiguation, uh, and they are like much more expert people in the room. Like, but it's basically like if it's very close uh, to disambiguate between uh, uh, like you know two words, like you need some sort of additional signal, either in the text or like in the social signal. Yeah, if you have it, then you can do the task well. If not, then like you know, it will fall back to some regular answer. Yeah. There's a quick question. So, uh, is the for writing scaling still an issue? I, I actually work on multi model. I, I work on scale diffusion. So I treat the text part as a black box. So uh, I but I think there is some uh, flash attention recently that I would uh, allocate a different part of the. Um, if you use other than VRAM. So, uh, is that still an issue? It's, uh, I mean, so theoretically, it's still an issue. Like, so, flash attention still, like, it doesn't do an approximation. It just, yeah, like, because on GPU, GPU, you can do it much faster. So, yeah. overall, like, it doesn't appear like it's. Yeah, yeah, but it, yeah it's just considered the GPU, right? Yeah, I think, like, you, you uh, yeah, like, it won't, like, um, uh, add too much thing, but again, like how well can you describe the model? So for a user, like a lot of times, like if we have to describe, like we'll describe, like say maybe the past ten. That's it's not just like a one or two words. Like you almost add like maybe uh, like hundred, two hundred, thousand additional code. So that's where it starts to see. And again, it depends on the problem. Like if you are in a very latency sensitive uh, like new setting, like where you have to like give the response in a few milliseconds, then yes, it does add. Yeah, but yeah, like there are like a lot of people actually working exactly on those problems, like either in an approximate manner or by using better hardware. Okay. So I'll just like quickly summarize like all some of the things in like one of the follow-up work, uh, and which is that we came up with like this uh, now unified model, which has like looks at all these contexts and tries to just work uh, with them directly as if like each token can either be a word word-based token or it can be a social context-based token and that's like a key idea and you have like all these types of different types of context you have like you know URLs, uh, like you know uh, images, hashtags, uh, mentions and what we call them is like we said that these are non-textual units uh, uh, like or NTUs in a tweet and they should be represented using like their social context as opposed to like you know, just them, them being treated as locals. And I'll give you an example. So if you just run a direct tokenizer over, like, so how the model splits the text into words, it will actually split up, like, so for example, the word turtle day into, like, four, uh, like, yeah, four different, five different tokens. Like, almost every other, like, you know, hashtag gets split up into multiple tokens. URLs get split up into so many tokens. But in reality, like, they all have, like, their own, like, singular meaning. And we said that, like, you know, 
instead of splitting them into these multiple tokens, let's just replace them by their social credit. And that's what we did here. So if you see here, like now we have, again, I've written in that text, but to the model, we input each one as their own social context embedding. And then like we basically again go back, we learned these embeddings from these large scale, like now, earlier I was just using a homogeneous graph, which is like two cities which are closer to each other. Now we are going into heterogeneous graph, uh, which is like again something which like a lot of good research is happening on heterogeneous graph at UIUC, especially like uh, for the JV Hans group. Uh, so, and what we do is like, you know, we learn uh, the representation from these heterogeneous graphs, again feed them to the model, and our goal was we want to get good general purpose to each representation, which many other teams can do, so that they don't have to be done. Once we have created a tree representation, we should want to be able to generate the output. And this is like one of the sample graphs we had, like, you know, user authored the tweet, user was co-mentioned in the tweet, favorited the tweet, and so on. And uh, same modeling objective as LM stock. We trained it on a pretty big model. We tested it on like the perplexity, like the regular language modeling objective. It was improving. And then we tested on like multiple downstream tasks, and we saw that okay, like for almost all tasks, like these adding the social context from either the author or the hashtag like, helps us improve the performance significantly. And one of the things again, as I was like mentioning in the LM stock paper, like is it effective? So, like the key idea is like if you have the context available, you should use it, and that should help you improve the performance. If it's absent, you should be as good as the regular model, right? So you should not degrade, uh, like as opposed to the regular model. And we found that, like in that uh, case, also holds true. Like whenever we have, uh, and so overlap means like you know we saw this context both during <coughs> training and testing, and non-overlap means like you know we did not see during both, uh, like, uh, we only saw it at test time. And we see that like, it holds true, so like most of the time, the context doesn't break. Oh, yeah. And like, this uh, also holds true across uh, like, the different tasks we have. One very important thing, like which many other people do, is like they do a post-concatenation. Uh, they'll say, like, okay, we'll have like, just text-based representation, and then we'll have just a context representation. We'll just concatenate that. What we found is that that leads to sometimes overfitting to the context, uh, as I'll show here. So many times, like you know, the word post concat, like we'll have on the non-overlap case, like it actually like degrades the performance, or like the performance is not as better as the one which uses the context in the initial layer. So in our hypothesis, that if it's in the initial layer, the model learns to ignore it if it's not present, uh, as opposed to if it's in the uh, outside. Layer. And that's uh, kind of the uh, ending of my talk. Like, you know, social context is quite useful, especially as we move to language models. And uh, uh, yeah, like, you know, if you can improve the coverage of these social contexts, like, you have like more broader, broader social context available, uh, you can like solve these tasks like uh, in a much better manner. And I'll just quickly follow up with like some more follow up work uh, for people. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. I, yeah, but yeah, uh, thank you everyone.